This is Selma Schimmel at the Multidisciplinary Cancer Congress 2011 in Stockholm. Today we're joined by Professor Dr. Nathan Cherney. Professor Cherney is the Norman Levin Chair of Humanistic Medicine at Charitzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. Professor Cherney, when is enough enough when it comes to treatment? Unfortunately, for, pa for, for patients whose illnesses are not going to be curable, um, there comes a point where, the, where the, uh, the disease is essentially resistant to further treatment options and further ad administration of further treatment is more likely to harm than to help. And, um, and one of the messages I always give to patients is that the chemotherapy or biological treatment, radiotherapy, this is not the treatment. This is a, one tool, part of a whole person care package. And if, if we're at a point where it's doing more harm than good, it shouldn't be there, and we need to be focusing elsewhere. And emotionally, we often talk to people about courage. There often, often the portrayal of the courageous cancer patient is the person who's saying, I'm gonna take another treatment, no matter how difficult and how challenging it is. But there's a different sort of courage as well, and that's the courage to say, look, to be able to, to deal with a, new, with a changed reality, to say that, you know, that this, this isn't good for me and to say that, that right now I've got to take the courageous step of refocusing my priorities on my family and my loved ones, on, on feeling as comfortable as I can, on um, issues of legacy, of you know, what are the important things that I want to be leaving behind for my family. The, these aren't easy. Um, and by, by, be, by, be, by being able to talk about things like courage, um, love, as part of the oncological dialogue, this is really, you know, this is part of the skill set required to help move people down this path. But it seems to me that there's yet another dialogue that has to happen, which is that dialogue about this very natural component about living and life, which is also about dying. And our culture doesn't seem to foster and encourage those discussions. I think that that's. I think it's very true. I think it, 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 I mean, in the different worlds that I work in, or that I've worked in between the United States, Australia, Israel, and Europe, I think that there are a mul multiple different ways in which people deal with it. Um, you know, the media, in a sense, helps foster a death-denying culture, which is which often makes our work m m much more difficult. But but you know, the truth of the matter is, and we say this. The book is that all lives come to an end, and that as, as, uh, although no one wants to have to, to deal with this and to confront this, um, for many pa for many patients this is going to be part of the evolution of the disease, and and unless you, 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 you can either confront this and deal with this in a constructive way, or it can become an ordeal, or it can become a major ordeal, um, with the expenditure of an enormous amounts of uh, time and energies pursuing futile things that, that, that not only may not help, but they may actually harm and undermine the time that's left. What is a quality death? Death is not a, a, a sudden event. Death is a process leading to the end of life. And the things that I try to emphasize with my patients re relate to, um, to relationships and to, to love, to issues of legacy, of the of the parts of you that you want to leave behind for the people that are going to continue afterwards, uh, and comfort. Um, and I guess you know, it's really maybe I should tie in comfort and function, because even with people whose health is deteriorating, we, we, we strive to try to keep them as functional as possible as long as possible. Um, and uh, that 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 you know. You know uh, uh, when we see that people are, 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 have got strong bonds and relationships or are fostering and, and using this time with their important relationships, when we can see that, that they've had the opportunity, at least, to, to, to deal with issues of legacy, of things that they would like to leave behind, or messages, or videos, or you know, even the, most, the tangible things like a will. Um, um, you know, the, you know, the, the, these are important parts of closure. And um, and ending a life well is about a proper is about a proper closure. How important do you find the role of faith for uh, 
patients and families that are facing end-of-life issues? Okay, I, I'll broaden the issue because I think you know, a, a lot of my patients, particularly where I work in Jerusalem, have strong religious convictions, but a lot of other people have spiritual convictions that are not related to any formal religion. Um, you know, my friend and colleague Harvey Chochnov, who's a, a wonderful psycho-oncologist, has been researching issues related to what gives people the desire to live, people dealing with, 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 um, uh, with terminal illnesses. And the most important predictors of the desire to live aren't physical comfort or pain or things like that. It's things like um, hope, dignity, um, 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 feelings of being, well, of being supported. Um, and these sort of issues of dealing with people's sense of meaning, sense of purpose, sense of dignity, are really important to attend to. And, and this is why, we, you know, in our department, you know, in our department, we've developed a very strong spiritual care service. And in fact, you know, this is part of a, a core element of uh, of any multidisciplinary uh, palliative care program. So, Professor Cherney, world economics as they are, yeah. what role? Do you think that is actually going to play? We know there's changes going on in the United States as it relates to our health care delivery system and palliative care and hospice care. All of that is becoming uh, much more visible now in our dialogue. But overall, what is the connection between the world economy and its impact on treatment and these kind of decisions patients that are dealing with serious illness? There is a concept in medicine which is called marginal medicine. Marginal medicine is medicine which makes very little difference to outcomes, but which costs a lot of money. And um, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. Um, we, we've recently seen that the FDA made the brave decision to de-license de um, um, bevacizumab or Vastin in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Um, you know, this, was, this was seen as a very, very uh, controversial and somewhat bold decision. But the decision was based upon the two understandings. Number one, you know, that in no study had Vastin been shown to, to lengthen the survival of, 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 breast, of women with metastatic breast cancer. And not only was it not improved, not, le not lengthening the survival, it didn't even improve their quality of life. So this issue that they had shown in one study that it lengthened the progression-free interval by a number of months became something which is more cosmetic than real. It wasn't making people feel better, it wasn't making people live longer, and yet it was costing tens of thousands, sometimes, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, so. And, and also, you know, putting some people at risk of, of side effects from the Avastin. So, in terms of providing benefit to patients, at, um, it really wasn't doing that adequately, and it was at an, an enormous individual and community cost. These sort of issues and these sort of discussions are going to start to become more poignant. The way in which the outcomes of clinical trials are published and discussed is often a real problem because it's often very misleading to people. You know, people reading, you know, when people read the term progression-free survival is increased. The, you know, for the lay reader in particular, it makes people feel, oh, this makes you live longer. But, but it's, it's inappropriate use of language. I mean, um, Leonard Saltz, from the, you know, in, you know, the, the major GI oncologist, wrote a wonderful editorial in the, um, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology saying that this is a misleading term and we should be, we, we should be using the term progression-free interval, not, you know, get rid of the survival word out of there because it's not about that. One of the things that we're interested in doing to, to make the results of clinical trials more understandable is to introduce a grading system for the degree of likely clinical benefit. Um, so, it is, so that's to say that, you know, the, 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 the treatments that, that, that improve overall survival these are the treatments that you know, have major clinical benefit. Treatments that, can, that don't improve overall survival, but it can improve quality of life, um, or median survival by more than a couple of months, 
we would call these having substantial clinical benefit. Treatments that, in, that, improve, that, can, that improve average survival by a couple of weeks to less than two months, you can't call this a major breakthrough. Yeah. And, and, and telling patients that, this, that they should need to spend tens of thousands of dollars or their insurers you know, for, that, for that small amount of benefit may actually be a misleading. So what do you tell the patient that says, my daughter's wedding is in six weeks and I want to try to do anything I can to hang on to that occasion? Everyone's targets are different and, you know, and, and, and this is the issue about individualized medicine. Um, and I, I would say that we'll do everything we can to get you there, um, but understand that our tools are limited. Um, and, but we will do and we'll do our very best. Um, you know, take aw take away the target, take away the target. Um, and if you have, and I, when I have an, an, an uninsured patient um, who says, "Is there anything more that you can give me?" and this is now second line treatment with, with cancer of the pancreas. Do I really want to tell them that they should be taking Tarceba, which can increase their median survival by two weeks? That Tarceba will cost them their entire family income per month until they die. Is that fair? Is that fair to the patient? Is that fair to the family legacy? Yeah, but by putting the option on the table, what you just did is you gave someone choice. But I won't tell people there's, there's, there, there, there's no choice when there is. But, but when I put an option on the table, I think I need to contextualize it to see in a very honest and direct way that this is really not likely to make any difference to their, to their overall survival and well-being. You work within a very select area of oncology and, and medicine in general. How did you land up in this particular area of, of, as a clinician? It's a complex story. Um, number one is I grew up in a, in a house where my father was a family doctor who did a lot of his own terminal care and my mother taught communication skills. And so these were you know, the issue of both um, commitment to patients and commitment to communication were things that, that I grew up in. Secondly, um, when I was a first year medical student at the end of the year I developed testicular cancer which metastasized to the lung. Um, and this was really at the cusp with the just where, where cisplatin had just been introduced into practice. Um, so, you know, I, I was really one of the one of the beneficiaries of the of the, uh, of the first generation of Larry Ironhorn's work on testicular cancer, um, which you know we, which had changed the the long term survival of testicular cancer from 25 percent to 95 percent. Um, thirdly, I had to. Uh, I, I, I had a thoracotomy to remove the remnants of a metastasis and, uh, and from that experience I learned the importance of treating pain because you know, getting an intramuscular injection of pethidine every four hours didn't cut it. Um, fourthly along the line I was very influenced by the early works of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and, uh, and the contribution that one, can, that one can make to the lives of people with incurable illness. Um, um, and you know, so all, all of these sort of things together sort of guide, guided me along this path and, and I wanted to go into an area of medicine where I would be at the cusp between medicine, um, psychology and, and, uh, and, uh, and ethics and, uh, you know, and this is where I found myself. Well, I'm very moved. I didn't know any of this about you and when a physician who also speaks out and says, oh, by the way, I'm also a survivor. That, for the patient, even knowing that, it puts you um, in a whole different category in the way the patient relates to you. I really want to thank you for being that open. I understand a lot more now, um, and I really thank you for sharing that. It's a pleasure. Yeah. You know, the, I, I, uh, but I've been on the public record about this, and I've written about my experience of having been a patient. And, you know, and often when patients are facing tough decisions, I tell them, look, I, I, I've been on your side of the desk. Um, and uh, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and I know what it feels like to be having to be thinking about and dealing with these sort of options. And as I say, th that is a tool that you, you don't need to have that to be able to be an effective communicator, but, but, but it's sometimes 
it can be an important key to help people get past difficult decisions. Professor Dr. Nathan Shirney, I hope we get to do a lot more together with you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.